renewable energy right of way. When you see a, a, a project application for renewable energy right of way, the first thing we have to do here at BLM is check for plan conformance in our resource management plan or RMP. And that's gonna be another term that you hear thrown around a lot um, if you participate in BLM's project uh, permitting process, the RMP. So BLM's uh, resource management plan is not that different than what you might see in a county or a city land use management plan or comprehensive plan. There's essentially uses that are going to be permitted um, out on the landscape. And, um, and then for some of those uses, uh, there may be a variance required. Um, and that's where we're at. So um, we take a look at uh, plan conformance in our RMP. And from there, we take a hard look uh, through an environmental analysis under what we call the National Environmental Policy Act or NEPA. Um, and this is probably what most members of the public who are typically involved in BLM stuff is. We go straight to the NEPA and we get you know a public process in that. But solar projects are treated a little bit differently than other um, rights of ways. Um, our resource management plans, our RMPs, consider solar energy projects issued uh, or under rules issued in 2012 and 2013 and um, what's called the Western Solar Plan or the Restoration Design Energy Project or RDEP or RDEP. Uh, these plans were collaboratively developed um, and established a process and criteria which must be met before a solar energy project can be accepted and begin its permitting under NEPA. So when I kind of said we have this like variance, we sort of have this like pre-NEPA stage, if you will, and that's where we're at. And then we talk a little bit more about the process and about these categories. So uh, BLM lands fall into three categories. We have solar energy zones, well, for renewable energy, three categories. We have solar energy zones, or SEZs, and they've been designated as these preferred locations and thus are automatically in plan conformance. So if you will, that's your zone where solar is allowed. In fact, it's a preferred land use in that area. In uh, BLM Arizona, we have three solar energy zones. We have one outside of Yuma, one near Buckeye, Arizona, and one near the town of Brenda in La Paz County. Um, right now, all three of those solar energy zones have projects committed to them at various stages of development. So those are essentially occupied. Um, then we have a, a group of lands that are excluded from development or exclusion areas. This is where solar would rarely, if ever, be allowed. And those would be wilderness areas, um, national conservation lands, ACECs or areas of critical environmental concern, uh, critical habitat. And there's about 20 other criteria in there that essentially will exclude lands from potential for solar energy development. And then we have all this remaining land out there, and that's what's called variance land. And that's where Hopper is proposed, is in variance land. So these are areas that may be appropriate for a solar energy application on a case-by-case -case basis, but only after a process through which stakeholders, uh, cultural and natural resource staff here at BLM, and the general public, or you, um, have an opportunity to examine the project concept and comment. If we determine that a project may move forward, then permitting would continue under NEPA and the public would be afforded continued opportunities to participate in scoping and comment periods. So um, our objective today is to present this proposal to the public and offer a chance to ask and answer some questions and collect comments that we can consider at this very early stage of project development. And I really wanna emphasize that right now, we're at a very early stage of development where the project is essentially a concept and we're just trying to determine if this concept might work or if it would um, uh, create a, a conflict that could not be overcome through design or other sort of uh, features. So that's where we're at right now. Um, and I'm going to turn it over to Intersect Power and Camille, um, go ahead and take it away. Thanks so much, Derek. Um, so I'll do a quick introduction of myself and then turn it over to Marissa Mitchell from the Intersect team to introduce herself and then we will dive into the presentation. So I'm Camille Waffinger. I'm a principal on the environmental and permitting team at Intersect Power, which is the proponent for the proposed Hopper project. Um, you'll see the entity IP Land Holdings LLC on all the project documents um, that are available on e-planning. And that entity is a subsidiary of Intersect Power. Um, so I'll hand it over to Marissa to do a quick introduction. Thanks, Camille. My name is Marissa Mitchell, and I'm the head of environmental and permitting for Intersect Power. And I'm most 
mostly here to just answer any questions that may arise that um, I, I could be helpful for, but otherwise I will turn it over to Camille and our consultants at SWCA. Thanks, Marissa. Um, Janet, would you be able to share the presentation? Perfect, thank you so much. All right, so um, first I really wanna thank absolutely everyone and express our appreciation for you all taking valuable time out of your day to participate um, and provide feedback on the proposed project. It's really helpful to us and the BLM as we're going through this process of evaluation. Um, so as a company, Intersect Power, um, we view this process, public engagement, as both the most important part of the process and one of our very favorite parts, um, getting to engage with the public, understanding issues that stakeholders care about and identifying concerns early on is really important to us to make sure that we're developing projects that are boons to the localities in which they're built. And we're very focused on collaborative engagement with local communities in that pursuit. Um, before we dive in, I also want to emphasize, re-emphasize what Derek mentioned that this project is, is in very, very early stages, has not been approved to move forward yet. Um, the initial sighting and interest in this particular location is based on factors such as access to available transmission infrastructure, insulation and solar resource, land designation by BLM, so the variance land that Derek discussed, and then desktop level evaluations of vegetation, biological, cultural, land use, and other resource conflicts. Right now, at this point in the process, we're trying to gather as much information and data as possible about these and other resource constraints to ensure that we understand the potential impacts and conflicts of the project and can adjust the proposed project and or mitigate accordingly. Um, so we welcome any and all feedback today and we'll take it all back to our team and into account as this project is evaluated both in this variance process and if authorized to move forward through this process, the eventual NEPA process. Um, so next slide. Janet, so here's just a quick agenda of the items that we will go through. I will talk through um, sort of the project overview, goals, components, and the construction process and schedule. And then Janet will jump into the resources to discuss what um, studies have been completed so far and um, what will be completed, um, assuming the project is authorized to move forward. Next slide. All right, the first project description. Um, so this project is located in southeastern Graham County in Arizona. As you all know, it's about 20 miles southeast of Safford, Arizona in the San Simone Valley. Um, so we have applied for a 35 to 50 year right of way grant from the BLM to construct, operate and maintain an 1000 megawatt solar generation facility and then an associated battery energy storage system which would store some of the power produced from the PV facility. Um, the current proposed footprint for the project or the, the, um, the land that we filed on is about 9,900 acres, which is obviously a huge amount of land. And so I want to emphasize that the way that we handle things at Intersect Power, we will, you know, file on a very large portion of land with the understanding that that is going to be shaved down and will be, you know, the actual footprint of the solar facility will be kind of an amoeba or funky shape within the original project area filing um, based on the resource constraints that are identified um, throughout the process. So um, definitely it's not going to be like 9,900 acres of pure PV array. We um, you know, are very much expecting that the footprint will be um, avoiding a variety of areas and will be jiggled around or shrunk um, based on the feedback that we get today and throughout the process. Next slide. Um, as I mentioned in the introduction, part of the reason that this particular location was um, very interesting to us um, for a solar facility is that it is located very close to two large transmission lines. So um, the Tucson Electric Power 345 kV line runs right through the project site. So you can see it in that diagram starting in the southwest corner and running up to the northeast in kind of an orangey brown color. Um, so that's the Tucson Electric Power line. And so that is one potential option for interconnection of the project to the Arizona electric grid. The other option is um, the Arizona Electric Power Cooperative 230 kV line, which is a little bit west of the project site and kind of follows Highway 191. Um, so we would potentially interconnect to either one of those two transmission lines or both of them, depending on um, where we're able to obtain offtake contracts for um, the total power of the, from the project, the 1,000 megawatts. Next slide. 
Uh, so the goals of the project, big one is to create renewable energy um, that would then be used to power homes, businesses, et cetera, on the Arizona grid. Um, the project would be bringing living wage jobs to Grant County, as well as sales tax revenue by establishing a point of sale for equipment and services in the county. Um, our company works really hard to minimize environmental impacts of our project by using existing utility corridors, transmission lines, and roads. Again, that's part of the reason this was an intriguing area for this project is we're not, you know, having to build a whole new transmission line to get this power um, into the grid. There are two proximate transmission facilities that exist um, that we can tap into very, fairly easily. Um, we would also be using existing roads to the extent that it's feasible um, out there on site to try to minimize environmental impacts of the project. Um, and then on a bigger picture, the project would be supporting global, national, state, BLM, and local decarbonization goals um, with some clean solar power and battery storage. Next slide. All right, so digging into the specifics of the project. So um, for folks who maybe aren't super familiar with solar PV facilities, um, there are solar panels arrayed throughout the project on um, steel frames and the solar panels are comprised of photovoltaic cells that convert solar power into electricity. Um, the panel faces are dark in color, minimally reflective and very absorb absorptive. Um, the facility would also include a battery energy storage system as discussed. At this point, there are a variety of battery technologies that are um, being considered. And so that decision would be made a little bit further down the line, um, uh, assuming the project is approved to move forward as to which kind of battery technology it would utilize. Um, there would be up to four project substation, which would be uh, transforming the power that's produced from the solar panels and stepping it up to the voltages necessary um, to interconnect to the broader electric grid, and then potentially up to two switch yards, which would be located on those two power lines that are existing out there, and that would be just transferring the power from our project to those lines. Um, if we move forward with uh, interconnecting to the EPCO line, there would be a project Gentile line, um, which you guys could see in that uh, project outline in the purple that showed um, you know, reaching from the project site over to that EPCO line. And that would be about 175 foot wide, four and a half mile long right of way that would just contain utility poles and a Gentile line um, to interconnect the project over to that EPCO facility. Um, lastly, there would be roads. As I mentioned, we'll be trying to use existing roads as much as possible. Um, access is currently proposed using exit infrastructure off of Highway 191. And then there would be an on-site roadway system with a perimeter road, internal access roads. Um, I think that is everything. So next slide. So the construction process, um, construction activities would extend for about 24 to 36 months since it's a pretty large facility. Um, all of the equipment would be manufactured offsite and then transported to the project site. Um, there would be erosion and sediment control and pollution prevention measures implemented on site. Um, as far as the grading of the site, portions of it might be, might need, you know, would need to be graded and compacted, particularly the location of the substation and the battery storage facilities. Um, we as a company generally try to really minimize the extent to which we're, you know, totally clearing the land, leaving nothing there. We, um, you know, we'll try to leave root balls for vegetation and um, ensure that, you know, some of the native shrubs can return after con the construction process is done. So, um, well, at this point, we don't have an exact construction plan because this project is still um, uncertain. Uh, there, you know, there, there are parts that would need to be leveled and then other areas that might be tiered or left with existing contours, just depending on the final design and the topography. Um, there will be some temporary construction staging areas, a long-term O&M building located on site. We discussed the Gentai already a little bit. Um, there would be poles with foundations excavated up to about 35 feet or more. Um, and then roads that would be utilizing the existing roads as much as possible up to about 50 feet wide outside of the facility and then inside the facility about 24 feet wide and surfaced with gravel or compacted dirt. Next slide. Here are some photos of the existing access roads and as I mentioned sort of depending on um, what existing roads would need to be used for and their existing conditions they may need to be improved or could be used as is um, if they're in pretty good shape. Next slide. So some of the requirements for construction. During construction, up to about 1,600 acre feet of water would be utilized for dust, dust depression. 
And that would be obtained either from a local water purveyor or through an on-site groundwater well. Um, the construction workforce would be about 500 people at uh, peak construction and then about an average of 320 workers per day. Those folks would all be sourced from local communities um, providing local jobs. Uh, vehicles, it would be pretty standard. We we'll use Deanna construction site, flatbed trucks and trailers delivering equipment, some heavier equipment for grading and road development and actual construction, and then commuter vehicles for workers on site. Uh, we've discussed roads pretty extensively, but there would be some coordination with ADOT and Graham County Highway Department um, as far as traffic plans and traffic control to make sure that the project isn't uh, contributing to traffic in the area. Next slide. Um, for O&M, solar facilities are pretty passive, so there's not a lot of, um, you know, resources required during operation. So there'd be about 70 acre feet annually for panel washing. Um, it also, you know, solar facilities also get washed when it rains, so that's great. Um, uh, there would be about 20 permanent staff that would be comprised of some folks that were are on site most of the time, and then others that are on call um, during the day, depending on what's going on on site. You, the uh, equipment is pretty minimal. There would be trucks and um, forklifts, et cetera, for some routine maintenance, pretty uh, much less heavy equipment than used during construction, though if there were any large rep repairs required, there could be some heavier um, vehicles out there. Next slide. All right, project schedule. Uh, so we submitted the SF-299 and plan of development to BLM this past spring. And um, right now in the fall and winter, we're going through the variance process. So the variance factors report has been prepared and is available on the BLM e-planning website. Um, we're completing resource surveys, which Janet will speak to in a few minutes, and then going through the public meetings right now. Um, if the variance application for the project is authorized to move forward, the NEPA process would likely begin in 2023 and be conducted throughout the year of 2023 and into 2024. And then if the right of way grant is ultimately issued for the project, construction would occur over a 24 to 36 month period between 2024 and 2026. And then the project would reach commercial operation in late 2026. It's operated, it's rated to operate for about 35 to 50 years. And so that it would depend on the ultimate length of the right of way grant that is issued for the project. Next slide. All right, I will hand it over to Janet with SWCA, which is our environmental consultant helping us out uh, to understand the resources on the project site. And she will introduce herself and Krista and then walk through some of the analysis that's been done so far and what's next. Thank you, Camille. Hi, I'm Janet Gwynn. I'm the project manager for SWCA. Uh, Krista, if you're there, if you can wave. Uh, Krista is the deputy project manager. Um, and together we're supporting this project with some environmental due diligence uh, and developing of that variance factors analysis report or VFAR as we call it. Um, so Krista and I prepared some slides on what we know about key resources, uh, the resources that we think uh, folks tonight would be most interested in, in and around the project area. We chose to focus on surface water, grazing and other land uses vegetation and wildlife and cultural resources, but we can definitely talk about other resources that you have questions about. So where does the information from this come? Uh, it comes from a couple of sources. Uh, the first one is what we call a critical issues analysis or CIA. This is a desktop evaluation that's done pretty early in the project focusing on land use, ecological settings, soils, wildlife, and, and water features, uh, reviewing cultural studies. Um, it's developed to support a plan of development and it's used by Intersect to identify those risks and evaluate those design features. The second document we are using is that actual variance factors analysis report. That evaluated about 22 factors uh, Derek talked about this to identify those resources of concern related to land use plan conformance, key risks, biological resources, conservation values, recreation values, all of that multiple use that happens on BLM land. And finally, uh, we've done a general habitat assessment, a fieldwork effort um, to build on that desktop analysis. 
Uh, we've already conducted that field work and now we're working on the report and that's helping refine the understanding of vegetation, wildlife, water resources on the site. So if the variance is authorized, there's additional pre-NEPA analysis that we'll be working on. And the goal of that is to enhance the understanding of cultural resources, water resources, potential water sources for the project, and looking at appropriate design features to work into the project. Um, you know, there's already been programmatic planning related to solar in Arizona, the REDEP, as we call it, the ROD, that had a lot of design features. But once you know specifics about a project, that's when you can really think about those site-specific design features, the best ways to avoid or minimize resources. So that's the goal of that. And then finally, um, then we would proceed to the NEPA process, and that's where we'd really analyze resources in greater detail. So looking, I chose to start with water resources here. Uh, surface water in this project area kind of runs in a diagonal fashion from southwest over to northeast over to the San Simone River. We have identified 17 linear features. They're all ephemeral washes. There's a, about 650 acres of 100 year floodplain within the project area. Um, and the project design will need to avoid those areas or uh, provide compensation. So this conceptual design map kind of shows, I don't know if you can see my cursor. Can you see that as I'm moving around? Sweet, okay. So Camille talked about the amoeba-like design. This isn't really showing that, but it's showing how in the Northern part of the project area, these linear features just might be buffered by a certain number of feet to protect those areas, those resources. Whereas in the Southern area, because of the nature of the floodplains and the, the linear surface water features intersect just might not choose to develop this area at all. And certainly further refinements would happen to this design. So grazing uh, is the next resource. The uh, project area does cross two grazing allotments, the Tanki and the Van Gossig grazing allotments. And there are uh, grazing improvements in infrastructure within the project area. This is one picture uh, showing the fences. And you can also see that there are some water tanks online. So next steps, NEPA would need to identify those potential impacts and identify mitigation to uh, reduce impacts to livestock grazing. And BLM would also be involved here and per their own requirements, they would need to notify permittees at least two years in advance of any changes in allotments. Uh, moving on to other land uses, um, as Camille uh, talked about, there are other transmission lines in the project area. In fact, that's one of the reasons why this particular site was located. There's also existing roads in the area. There's a railroad just to the east of the project area. And the Sanzia transmission line, it's not constructed yet, but it is planned south of the project area. So that's another potential land use that could come into play as well. Uh, in terms of recreation, there are no developed recreation areas on the project area. There are no special recreation management areas or SRMAs or extensive recreation management areas, BLM calls them ERMAs. Um, so NEPA, the NEPA process, um, recreation would be one of those issues that's analyzed and they would be looking at any impacts to dispersed recreation in this area and design features to avoid or minimize impacts to those resources. Uh, moving on to vegetation and wildlife, starting with vegetation. Um, so regap data identified this area mostly a shrub scrub area. Our field work indicated it was mostly shrublands and shrub invaded grasslands. Uh, there's more grassland in the western part of the project area. There's more mesquite in the center part of the project area, more creosote bush in the northeastern part of the project area. Uh, all of those washes, those 17 linear features I mentioned earlier, 
they're dominated by species such as mesquite and acacia. And in these areas, the individual plants are larger. There's a higher plant density uh, compared to the upland areas. There is one BLM special status species with potential to occur on the project area. That's the Chihuahua scurf pea. Um, it was not observed during the habitat assessment, but it could occur in sandy soils. And those soils and those associated veg types are mostly found in the northeastern portion of the project area. And there are also 16 plant species, mostly cactus, that are protected under the native uh, Arizona native plant law present in, uh, in the project area, but there are no saguaros. Uh, moving on to vegetation, the, the project area does not contain any uh, designated critical habitat, uh, does not cre uh, contain any Audubon designated important bird areas. There is potential for 16 BLM special status wildlife species to occur, five avian species, eight mammals, mostly bats, and three reptiles, one lizard and two turtles. And then the western part of the project area over by that Gentile line is within a linkage zone for species such as mule deer, javelina, uh, bobcat, and mountain lion. And so next steps in terms of wildlife and vegetation, we're working on that report. Um, and the report will include some recommendations for next steps, different surveys, additional work that might need to be done, and in particular, coordination with the Arizona Game and Fish Department or other agencies to look at uh, ways to minimize impacts to that wildlife habitat or those movement corridors. Um, and then I did want to note that some, um, if certain plants are removed, those ones protected by the Arizona um, native plant law salvage permits could be required. And then finally, um, I just wanted to provide a little information on cultural resources. Uh, there is not much information within the project area. Less than 1% of the project area has been surveyed. Uh, most of the surveys were completed over by the Highway 191 area for road improvements. Um, this information is actually for a cultural study area, which went a little bit wider, about one mile out of the project area. So in that one mile study area, there was one site within the project area, four sites outside of the project area, but still within that study area. And all of them were prehistoric artifact scatters. So next steps in terms of cultural resources, um, BLM is consulting with tribes as part of this variance uh, review process. And if the variance application is authorized, they would also consult with tribes during the NEPA process. Um, as part of NEPA pre-planning, we're uh, planning to do a cultural resources report, summarizing the information from the available sources that we have and coordinating with BLM to develop a sampling or a survey strategy um, to prepare for the NEPA process. Um, and then finally, Intersect is inviting tribal participation in any of those surveys. And with that, I will stop and turn it back over to BLM to see if there are any questions. Thank you. Thank you, Janet. It was very thorough. Appreciate it very much. So um, we have a lot of folks with us tonight uh, to, with, uh, I'm sure, some questions. And the best way that I think we can facilitate this, um, especially for those of you that are familiar with Zoom, if you go down and find the box that says chat, and you can open that up and it'll open up a little uh, chat window here. And um, rather than just all have us blitz or raise hands, if you could um, type your name into the chat, and if you want to type your question in there, that's fine, um, or uh, about the topic of your question, and we might be able to group some questions together, but um, go ahead and go to that chat, and if you have something, um, type in your name and, uh, and what you'd like to ask about, and then we will uh, try to queue you up and call you, um, call you out to, to ask those questions.
All right, we have first question came in from Nate. So Nate has a question about water use in roads. Nate, feel free to come off of mute and, uh, and ask a question. Yeah, I, I, can you hear me? Yeah. I guess my question is probably for Camille. Um, I just want to clarify on the water use and the road use. Um, what the one slide said there was 1,650 acre feet used for dust suppression. Is that annually or is that a one-time one time use for construction? Then it then it's the 70 acre feet annually, or how does that work? That's correct. Yeah. So the, the 1,600 acre feet would be over that, it would be spread out over that 24 to 36 month construction period for dust suppression. And we would obviously put other measures in place to minimize dust creation in the first place, um, but would use water to suppress dust when it does occur. Um, and then the 70 acre feet per year would be once that the facility reaches commercial operation in 2026. Um, throughout each year of operation, there would be approximately 70 acre feet used per year for panel washing and, um, you know, for the restroom facilities at the O&M building. Okay, and then, and then going back to the roads, you talked about using existing roads. I don't know, is, do you and the BLM kind of come on an agreement of who, who does the maintenance on those roads? They would main be maintained by us, um, the, one, the ones that would be used for long-term maintenance. There would be probably some roads that would only be used during construction and then would be you know, restored to the pre-construction conditions. And then um, the, ro the roads that would be used for long-term facility maintenance, they would be maintained as part of the, the project maintenance plan. All right, thanks, Camille. Nate, did you have anything else? Um, we can come back to you too if you have other questions, but want to make sure we keep on moving through. I'll let uh, some others ask. See what okay, happens. Okay, great. All right, uh, next question um, will come from Vance Bryce. Uh, Vance, go ahead and come off mute and um, introduce yourself and uh, and bring your question. Hi, Vance um, from the chamber. I'm just wondering if there's any um, economic development study that's done as part of the process. Yeah, we typically do um, do sort of a limited uh, economic impact analysis um, of all of our project locations, um, all of our project developments. Um, we have been using a model called the JEDI model that comes out of the National Renewable Energy Labs that sort of calculates the direct and indirect economic benefits of the project um, at an early stage. And then as the project is, is refined over time, um, we, we get um, more specific estimates of, of those economic benefits. But um, that's something that we can certainly plan to prepare and, and share with your office when, when it's complete. That would be awesome. Thank you. And uh, this is Derek here, and I can add a little bit more about economic impact studies. So that is um, a requirement, well, not a requirement per se, but certainly an issue that is in almost every single NEPA analysis that we undertake. And so economic analysis will, um, will be a very holistic uh, uh, approach. So we'll look at, of course, kind of base economics of what jobs would be created and when, and um, what effect that those, that employment would have um, in the regional economy. It may also be a look at how um, the economy may be affected, of course, if there is a reduction in uh, grazing out there, um, that's an economic impact itself. Um, there's environmental justice concerns as well that will be looked at in an economic impact study. And so um, BLM has an economist uh, on staff. We have like multiple economists actually, but we have an economist that works um, with BLM Arizona and BLM Arizona that would be uh, leading that study and um, leading the review of that study. So it'd be quite thorough if this project goes to NEPA. Thank you so much, that's perfect. All right, the next question, um, I just have the name is P. David. Um, yeah, go ahead and come up. Thank you, I'm on. Yeah, uh, thank you, Derek. This is for Intersect. And uh, I've looked at the uh, online portfolio and noticed about half the projects are in your portfolio are finished. And the other half are either under construction or in the pipeline meaning the planning stage. And my question is, of all the proposals we've heard to the BLM, all the, the uh, 
applications, most which didn't pan out. Intersect looks like the most promising of all the proposals I've seen in a number of, of years here at the Graham County Board of Supervisors. And so my question is, I know that the uh, feasibility and the uh, following through on the project, there are sometimes external factors like pricing, market prices. I was wondering how sensitive is the construction and completion of the Hopper solar project to market conditions, that is the uh, price of electricity? Yeah, that's a great question. And um, so definitely the, the feasibility of the project will depend on our ability to obtain off-take contract for uh, the proposed megawatts. And so, um, so we, we've already bid the project into uh, a, a request for proposals from EPCO um, to, you know, so they put out a request for proposals saying, hey, we're looking to purchase some renewable electricity. And so we'd love to see proposals from developers who have projects in their pipelines. And so we submitted a proposal into that RFP. Um, and similarly, we'll be doing so for any future TEP RFPs um, or other Arizona utilities that might be looking for um, power resources. So um, certainly that's a very important part of the process. And in order for the project to move forward, it does have to have a long-term contract revenue stream. Um, as far as the, the sensitivity to market conditions and the price of electricity, um, the, all of our contracts are long-term fixed price contracts. So when we sign an off-take contract, it's at a fixed price for the full life of the facility. And so, um, you know, we definitely will negotiate with the utility on that price. Um, but once that's locked in, it doesn't change. And so the project wouldn't be, wouldn't be, um, you know, sensitive to changes in the market because it would have a fixed contract, long-term contract with the utility. Thanks. Great answer. And we're, we're bullish on the FMI and we're, we're going to be bullish for intersect. So thank you very much. Thanks, Paul. Right. Um, Nate has a question again. Um, another question from Nate. So go ahead, Nate. I was just curious on on the the panels themselves. Are there you know is it a standard dimension for those? Uh, you know, kind of like how high are they off the ground? How big are they? And then uh, will there be will the facility be, be have a boundary fence? Will it be fenced off? Yes, I'll send I can. This one to Camille. Um, yeah. So uh, so the panel can the, the, their size will depend a little bit on the ultimate technology selected. Um, Marissa, if you have in your brain sort of a standard panel dimension, feel free to say what it is. I'm not remembering at this moment, but um, the, oh, she might be jumping on. Yeah, um, so typically they, they will be about uh, between two and four feet off the ground at their most uh, fully tilted angle. And they'll be about, um, nine feet above the ground surface at their maximum um, tilt angle. Um, of course, most of the time they're about six feet tall when they're um, fully flat um, during the, the peak of the day when the sun is the brightest. Um, but the dimensions of each panel is, um, I think they're about 12 feet by nine feet. Um, uh, but but the, the panels never go fully vertically um, uh, from the ground to to the sky, they're always on a some kind of angle. And all of that information is in our plan of development for the project. And we sort of, you know, we include the basically the maximum dimensions and height off the ground um, that you know the the sort of most conservative technology that would be, we would potentially use um, for the facility construction in the plan of development for the project that's submitted to the BLM. Um, and so then. On your question related to whether the facility will have a boundary fence, the answer is yes. The PV portion of the facility will have a boundary fence. Um, so in that diagram, which I can share my screen again so you can see it, um, the portion of the facility on the far east will have a fence, uh, but the Gentile, oh, thanks, thanks, Janet. Um, sorry, I just, okay. Yeah, so the so the the portion on the east that Janet's uh, cursor is encircling, that portion will be fenced. Um, but then the Gentai route, which is that purple line, if that Gentai is ultimately built, um, it would not be fenced. It would just be you know poles that then have a utility line strung from one to another. Uh, 
All right, thanks, Camille. Thanks, Marissa. Um, still open for questions here. If anybody Nick, has anything, jump in. Hey, Derek, Nick has uh, his hand up, Nick Broly. Oh, yeah, Nick. Go ahead and come off mute, Nick. My question, um, so so my, my name is Nick Broly. Um, my family is, uh, has the tanky allotment currently. Um, I have a, had a question. I was curious uh, if, if or at what point any of the alternate options that were discussed um, have been presented to, um, to IP and if uh, when we can, when does that process continue or get? Oh, I can take a shot at this one, Nick, and then, um you know, maybe have Ron and Scott talk a little bit more about it as well there in Safford. So um, what Nick's referring to is uh, some early outreach that we've done with um, permittees who might be affected by this project. And um, of course, that is one of those uh, multiple uses that we manage for out there. And um, Nick's family has uh, come forth and, and, and offered some um, alternatives. I understand that some of the other uh, grazing permittees out there have some ideas in their mind too that might lessen the impact of a project like this on their, on their area. Um, BLM is in a kind of responsive position, I guess you could say, um, at least early at this stage. And uh, we take what has been given to us and applied and we try to respond to that uh, as it's presented. In terms of giving um, information back, we've had some initial conversations with Intersect Power about some of the other areas that might be around there, but we're still sort of evaluating those as well. Um, and just looking at the different, I guess you could say the way that this box might shift around. Uh, one thing that I personally have brought up to Intersect Power was that after we uh, kind of clear the sort of basic procedures of this variant stage, which include hosting these meetings and kind of undergoing a, a review, um, that they may want to start to think about shifting their proposal around a little bit before we take the next step and decide whether or not this is gonna to move to variance. And so um, your contributions uh, and for the other grazing permittees out there, their contributions in terms of proposals or suggestions or things to think about really um, in, in how to actually draw that perimeter um, are important right now. And um, they'll, they may be incorporated early now, but if they don't make it into the variance per se, if Intersect decides like, no, we're comfortable with what we've drawn thus far, and we want to move that forward, um, that's fine, you know, but when it, if a project makes it to NEPA, which is, which is an if, of course, but if a project makes it to NEPA, NEPA um, analyzes alternatives. And that's the point where BLM is able to come in, I think with a bit more authority and say, hey, here are some other things that we think are feasible alternatives, you know, and we're gonna have to analyze these. So there's a, another stage where I guess you could say where BLM won't be in such a reactive position, but maybe in a bit of a more proactive position. And of course, we're not here to be adversaries to anyone. And we've suggested to IP already, there may be some things that we discuss in the next month or two um, about how this project may move forward into the next stages. Um, and you know, we'll just kind of keep on working it out with them. So there's not a, a tight deadline, but there's plenty of opportunities uh, for us to continue talking to IP at this stage. And then certainly in NEPA where we actually have um, mandated authority to do so. And that's kind of my spiel. Uh, maybe Scott or Ron, you might want to talk a little bit more about this in terms of. Uh... Yeah, I don't think I'll add much more Derek other than to say that, you know, the communication with the grazing permittees, um, other agencies, members of the public that you'll give us in comments that Ron will talk about here at the end of the meeting. Um, all those things are very important and um, we consider those things. And in your case, um, Nick, with that grazing allotment, um, we take your suggestions very seriously. And um, we have a good working relationship so far with Intersect Power and SWCA, and we'll continue to communicate um, with them as we move forward with the project. So um, we appreciate you guys' feedback and um, continue to, to give us that feedback as we move forward in the process. So thanks. And I'll...
and I'll reiterate what um, Derek and um, Scott said. And, you know, we have had those meetings, um, Nick and Nate, you know, right now is a great opportunity for you guys to uh, make those um, comments and um, put them in the, submit them on that, um, to the website that I'll be giving you guys here at the end of the, at, at the end of the meeting. All right, thanks. Thanks, Nick, for the question. All right, so I don't see any hands up, um, but go ahead and stick a hand up or put your name in the chat if you got something. All right, well, I won't call it just yet, but I will um, kind of fill some time here and talk about um, what I like to call the end game of the solar variance process, which I've hinted at a bit in some of the discussions here. But um, so we're going through meetings. We've um, we have a, a meeting earlier today that we completed with um, other agencies, federal, state, and local agencies are participant in that meetings. And oftentimes those ag those agencies have data and knowledge and perspective, and frankly, like uh, management mandates themselves, you know, laws and permits that they have to uphold. Um, and so they like to take a look at these projects in the variant stage and contribute some thoughts. Um, we're doing outreach with uh, sovereign tribal nations as well that uh, have concerns about cultural properties and cultural resources in that area. So that is ongoing. And then of course, there's this meeting here with the public. Um, after this meeting wraps up, um, in the next couple of weeks, BLM's resource specialists will continue to take a little bit of a deeper look at what um, Intersect and SWCA has put together. We'll probably have some comments back, some feedback on things that we'd like them to look at in a little bit more depth or to um, clarify or bring out some of the issues that were raised um, in the meetings that we've had and highlight those into the report that they're ultimately putting together for our consideration. Um, we are going to have comments open for a month here. And um, so written comments, either by email or by snail mail, would be great. Um, those are comments that will get scanned and recorded into uh, the public record for this project. And we'll incorporate those comments into our final briefing, which will be taken from Safford Field Office to the Arizona State Office, and then ultimately to the BLM director, um, who will give the final uh, approval as to whether or not the variance is granted. Um, and if the variance is granted, uh, then it will come back to Arizona. And that's where I said we will begin thinking about NEPA at that point. Uh, before NEPA starts, um, we've had some questions about timelines from others. So I'll just kind of share that now as like unprompted uh, discussion. But um, before NEPA starts, there's going to be a period of time where um, BLM and Intersect go out and start to collect more data that is uh, necessary to know um, is a refined project design and we develop different development scenarios that we analyzed in NEPA. And those surveys include everything from a class three cultural resource survey um, to uh, uh, wildlife um, surveys for uh, migratory bird surveys, uh, you know, water resources, traffic, there's all kinds of things that data need to be collected on and kind of put together in baseline studies um, to help us understand the impacts that might come from a project. So that period of time usually takes anywhere from six to eight months. Then NEPA would start a project of this size would typically typically be an environmental impact statement, which is um, the highest level of NEPA that we can do. Um, and the rough schedule of that from the time we officially start NEPA uh, to the time we reach a decision is about 15 to 18 months. So if we're projecting it out, um, as I kind of tell people, if all the stars were to align on the schedule and everything was going to be really smooth, um, we'd be about, you know, two years, two plus years away from having a decision in hand. But of course, there's a lot of stops along the way and a lot of contingencies and uncertainties that can delay a project, slow a project down, or um, actually uh, lead to uh, unfavorable decisions on a project. So um, we don't have anything down as a firm schedule just yet, just kind of like that rough projection. So that's what's kind of going on um, to the end of this. You know, We have about a month here to collect more comments, and then we'll make a recommendation on the variance. And if that comes through favorably, uh, then we will move on to NEPA after that. And the NEPA 
appeal process is a public process um, from the beginning at the scoping period, uh, all the way through comments on the draft and final, we'll likely have workshops and all kinds of stuff at that point. So um, you, the project may go dark for a little bit, but it doesn't mean that it's gone. It might just come back a little bit later in NEPA and we'll do a full re-engagement at that point with everyone. So that's kind of the end game here. Um, uh, I just want to make sure before we move along to any closing comments that uh, anyone who has a comment or question um, uh, has had the opportunity to, to weigh in. So if you still holding something, uh, feel free to put it in the chat box or throw your hand up. Um, but if not, I will uh, turn it over to Ron and Scott for some final comments. Uh, take it away. All right, let me share my screen one more time. Uh, so public comments, they're open up now. Um, you have until September 30 or September 17th to submit your comments. Um, the way you can submit them is through, we have an email set up, BLM, AZ, SFO, um, solar at blm.gov, or you can do them to mail um, through the mail. Just mail them to the Cypher Field Office, attention to me, and we'll get them scanned and, um, and put into our, our system. So um, Clara is also gonna check, um, share uh, uh, e-planning link with you. Uh, feel free to go to that link and there'll be information in there. There's the BFAR in there right now um, and some maps associated with the, with this. Um, the other thing will be loaded up into e-planning is this presentation will be uploaded into e-planning and the PowerPoint. but yet you get your um, comments in by close of business on September 17th. And all this information that I have right here is also on e-planning. And I'd love to just echo a huge thank you to everyone for coming out and listening today and by providing feedback and asking questions and everything. Um, this is, you know, everybody's time is very valuable. So we really appreciate it and look forward to um, seeing your written comments and incorporating them into the project project proposal as it hopefully moves forward. And I'd like to say, that I'd like to say thanks to everyone and then uh, for showing up today and for all the comments and also um, the presentations. I'll turn it over to Scott. All righty, thanks, Neil. Thanks, Ron. Yeah, I'll close this thing out just by saying um, thanks to Intersect Power and SWCA for putting together the presentation that we all saw today. I appreciate that. Also, I'd like to thank the BLM staff that um, came on to, to support and be available to answer any questions that you guys might have. And then lastly, and, and most importantly, thank you guys for um, showing up to the meeting. You know, Derek, Ron both talked about the, the comment period and it's important to go on there and show your support for the project, um, address any concerns that you might have, ask any questions, things that um, you think that we should consider. Um, I'd encourage you to go on there and provide those comments to us so we can consider those as we move forward. Um, and I know we'll be getting some, Nate, Nick, thank you guys for showing up. This is right in the middle of your guys' raising allotment out there. And we'll, we look forward to continuing that dialogue with you, um, as well as everybody else that's on the call that um, chooses to stay engaged. So thank you guys. And with that, I think we'll conclude the meeting. Um, we'll have a brief pause in case anybody else wants to come on here at the very tail end. But otherwise, um, I think we can start signing off and appreciate everybody's attendance. Thanks. All right, take care, everyone.